Thank you all. So let me ask a couple of questions. The first one is going to be to, to all of you. Do you think that Americans assume there is one Islam? And if so, why do you think this is the case? You're the professor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the short answer to that is yes. Most Americans do think of Islam as a monolith. And this is a very, very basic point that is, thank you. And we've already talked about this, right? So in terms of is the sects of Islam, like Sunni, Shia, I mean, we could go on and on, right? So clearly, Islam is not a monolith. And that should be quite evident to us in terms of theology. Outside of theology, we also have different ethnic groups, racial groups, so on and so forth. That should be obvious. Now, I want to push it slightly a bit further. And Ahmad is here and Colton is here, two of my students in my Muslims in America class. Ahmad is in the class now. Colton was in the class last spring. And Ahmad, I think you'll remember this, the other day we were talking about this, this point. We need to move beyond simply viewing Islam as a monolith, and even this idea of viewing Sunnis as a monolith, Shias as a monolith, Sufis as a monolith. Everything has become homogenized. Jihad is, is now a monolith, right? Sharia is a monolith. Even what Hasna is saying, this idea of a woman's experience, a Muslim woman's experience is only viewed or experienced in one way. We need to really start breaking these, these terms down. I mean, even Donald Trump, probably the first of many times his name will be brought up, but he, he said something that boggled my mind four or five months ago. He said, Islam hates us. Is Islam a living organism? Is it a human being? How can, how can, a, how can Islam hate us? I mean, it, it's hard to even wrap your head around that. We, we also have to separate this, the term Islam from Muslims themselves as well. Um, so what I'm getting at here is, yes, move beyond this idea that Islam is a monolith, but every single term that pertains to Islam also must not be viewed monolithically. May I, may I add? And I, I, I want to take advantage of the fact that we're on a college campus. And when I went to my courses in college, they told us to think and to ask questions, and even question the professor. Uh -oh. <laughs> no, I'm not, not that. <laughs> That's not where I'm going. <laughs> but religion, the way it is interpreted and practiced, is a social construct. You, you don't have one Muslim who can claim to practice Islam as it, as it was practiced in the seventh century. It's absolutely impossible. So let me take myself as an example. I'm African American, but I'm also Native American. I'm Cherokee. My wife is Eroquai. She's Native American. We had an experience, we were at Whole Foods, because I'm also a nutritionist. <laughs> we were at Whole Foods and someone saw her. She's Native American and Dutch and African American. Someone saw her at the Whole Foods and said, why don't you go home? Why don't you go back where you came from? Now, the, the knee-jerk reaction is, I was here before any of you all came. <laughs> the knee-jerk reaction is your ancestors committed genocide on my ancestors and wiped them off the face of the earth almost. But I use that to illustrate. Often when we engage in religion, we engage religion as a product of our experiences 
and circumstances and we accentuate the things in religion that addresses our immediate challenges. So much of the Islamic tradition I come from drew very heavily on Islam's tradition of social justice. They looked for those things in religion, in the religion of Islam, that, 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 that promoted social justice. Because many of them, their very basic human expressions were being systematically denied. So to say there's one Islam doesn't consider the fact that you have six billion, give or take, human beings on the face of the earth. And all of us have a unique set of circumstances, a unique social environment, a unique polit political environment through which we live and express our religion, and which often informs or actually can shape how we practice our religion, how we live our religion, and how we understand our religion. So just a study of the basic human condition would lead us to conclude that Islam as defined by a person in China would be completely different as Islam understood and practiced in reality by a person like myself because our social, social, social circumstances are different. Now, of course, you can go to the five pillars. We all believe in the oneness of God, and we give in charity, and we pray, and we fast. But how we even interpret the very events of Muhammad's life, we interpret them in a context often through our own unique experiences. That's all. All right. I want to get it. So by and large, the American Muslim population is better off financially and educationally than the average American, okay? Except when we talk about African American Muslims. According to research, African American Muslims tend to reside in lower income neighborhoods with fewer employment and educational opportunities. How do you think this makes the African American Muslim experience unique? Oh, thank you for that question. And I also, have to say the question itself was problematic when I read it and, and I engaged with it and I understood it. Because you can't separate African American Muslims from the African American experience in America. To separate the two is impossible, completely impossible. But I would, you may have even inspired another study by me. I'm serious. <laughs> Because I would hypothesize, because of the, the heavy emphasis in the development of Islam in America on having your own business, doing for yourself, and the, a great change that came in the mid-70s when the leadership for indigenous African American Muslims encouraged African Americans to understand the Constitution and demand that people respect the things that the American Constitution promises us and to educate ourselves and to get as much education as we can. I would like to propose a new study because I believe if we, if we, if we took it outside the larger context and we look just in the Muslim community, you are probably going to see African American Muslims more educated. You're probably going to see many of them better off financially than the whole group as a whole. But since, but because the foundation of the movement was to go back to your neighborhood that you came from and help people who are in 
a similar set of circumstances that you were in before you found the better way of life, there is a inherent, uh, there is a reinforced principle in the thought that even once you get your education, I have one, two, three, I have four college degrees, and next month, God willing, I have my fifth. I'm defending my doctorate in October. But I still drive, I live in Richmond. But I still drive 45 minutes every Friday and 45 minutes every Sunday back to the mosque that I'm the imam of that's in a lower socioeconomic neighborhood. Although I live in Richmond, I still drive and I go to the projects in Third Ward, Houston to have literacy programs, to have educational programs, to have anti-drug and alcohol programs, to have programs for the troubled youth. Although I live in Richmond, Texas, I still drive into some of the most challenging neighborhoods in Houston, Texas, because it, it was reinforced in our culture that part of our mission is to help those who are less advantaged. And then those who are still in those neighborhoods. I'm a professor at Texas Southern University. I have students in my class that are first generation college students. We can't forget that in the 60s, the, in Ole Miss, there was a civil war almost so that blacks could attend Ole Miss. And the president had to call the National Guard in so that the citizens of that, of that city did not attack, hang, and kill one black student that was trying to integrate. So even if, you, even if we're interpreting that many African Americans still live in these lower income neighborhoods, that has to be interpreted in context of the larger historical challenge of upward mobility in the black community. I know those of you who were born in my generation, we don't remember. But if we ask anyone in Houston that's 55, 60, 65, they still remember when things were segregated in Houston and blacks could only go to one restroom and whites could only go to one restroom. That's it. I want to push you a little bit about this idea of, of an omen and mosque, okay? I think that, well, maybe you can tell us why you think you need an all-women's mosque and you can't do the same types of leadership and religious educational development in a mosque that's poor. Um, so I wouldn't say you can't. Um, one, of the, one of the things that our very first khatiba or preacher um, talked about in her khutbah or sermon um, was a statistic uh, that talked about how over the past decade mosques have around across America have opened up tons of positions leadership positions for Muslim women on the boards you know within the organizational capacity but Muslim women aren't stepping up and I think that has to do with uh, just the psychological con or, or um, the psychological experience of trying something new, um, also being the first one, um, it's much easier when you have uh, a safe space to try things out in. Um, I'll give you a, an example. Um, so I have a friend uh, named Trevina, and um, she uh, she converted to Islam I think maybe seven years ago. And we've been friends for maybe like five, six years. Um, and one thing that I do whenever I am with uh, you know, other women and it's time to pray is I always try and push them to lead prayer. Um, and I try to, actually my, my roommate from USC is here. Uh, I used to do that to her as well. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, it's something that I, I always get, you know, whoever I'm with to, to, uh, to do. Um, and Trevina, out of all of my friends, she was the one friend I could never get to lead me in prayer, even if it was just the two of us. Um, and finally, in the women's mosque, 
she actually led a room full of 100 women in prayer. Um, and when I talked to her afterwards, she was like, you know what, I just felt like the, such strength being surrounded in this room, you know, with my sisters. I knew that if I were to forget a verse that they could chime in and correct me, she just felt supported. And I don't know if there's an academic way to describe the feeling and the sensation of sisterhood, but it is a real thing. And that's what the Women's Mosque is. It's a stepping stone, it's a bridge. Um, it's a place to experiment and, uh, and try out things that women haven't had a chance to do um, just because it is more daunting when it's a co-ed space. And it's not just gender specific things that we're experimenting with, right? Um, we also had, um, we had a, a Shia uh, khatiba come in our first year and give a khutbah and lead prayer. Um, we had a Sufi woman come, and so this is also a place where um, where women are able to explore in other avenues as well. Um, and then, lastly, I would say that the greatest um, the greatest value for me in creating this mosque was this middle ground pluralistic value. Um, and I knew going into it that you know there are mosques in America um, that are co-ed and that women lead the prayer. Um, but this is different from that. And, and those mosques tend to push away more conservative Muslims. And so what was really important to me was to create a mosque where everyone would feel safe and everyone, because if you have you know, a women-led co-ed space, automatically you're, you're kind of kicking out the conservative people. They won't even step in, step a foot inside. So I just wanted a place, you know, when we're seeing so much division, not only in the Muslim community, but in America, across the world, I wanted a pluralistic space where everyone could come in and feel that their religious views were respected um, and that they were just there on the basis of what was bringing them there, which is a connection to God, rather than using their, their differences as an excuse to not uh, come together. I'd like to ask that if you have a question that you'd like to pose to one of the panelists, please start lining up at the microphone on the other side, and I'll, I'll point to you, um, and we'll alternate between the microphones. And, and while people are coming to, to stand up at the microphones, let me ask Craig a question. As you know, there have been several events in Europe this past year that have heightened tensions between Muslims and non-Muslims, so the terrorist activities in Paris and Brussels and Nice, as well as the more recent kind of banal activities like on French beaches over Burkines. Um, in general, how would you describe relations between Muslims and non-Muslims in the United States versus Europe? Well, um, I'd say, is anyone familiar with Gert Wilders? Gert Wilders is a Dutch, few people are, right? Gert Wilders is, a Dutch, former Dutch parliamentarian, considered to be far right. He was spewing a similar anti-Muslim Islamophobic rhetoric uh, right after 9-11. Uh, and he became quite popular. He's linked in many ways to Ayn Hirsi Ali. Um, you have across Europe, uh, strong far right wing political parties that are relatively close to gaining full power in Austria. The, um, the far right in Austria were pretty close to becoming the dominant party. Um, you have the National Front in France and we see a trend across all of these far-right political parties, and the rhetoric is not too different from someone like Donald Trump, who says, uh, increase surveillance, let's potentially shut down mosques, let's ban all Muslims from coming in, let's ban Sharia, as if Sharia is even a single codified law book that you can actually hand someone, which it is not. So, we do see similar trends. I think it's this Islamophobic rhetoric has been happening in, in Europe for quite some time. But on the ground, in terms of how people are actually living in neighborhoods, and I'm talking demographic background of European Muslims, 